Cash returns $300 million from 1MDB to Malaysia. Health Ministry detects new cluster of COVID-19 in Sundayan. Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to News on 2 and its updates at noon with me, Mohamed Amin Carlos. Now, first story. Now, the government today announced that 300 million US dollars from One Malaysia Development Burhada 1MDB has been returned to the government by the United States of America. Now, Prime Minister Tantri Muhyiddin Yassin said the amount represents the funds recovered from asset seizures related to 1MDB under the Kleptocracy Asset Recovery Initiatives of the US Department of Justice, the DOJ. Now, in a statement today, Tansri Muhyiddin said on 30th October 2019, Malaysian fugitive Joe Lowe had reached a settlement with the DOJ pertaining to numerous forfeiture claims filed by the DOJ against assets he had purchased using 1MDB monies. Well, he said the $300 million represents some of those assets which had been forfeited and later sold. It also includes proceeds from 1MDB linked assets that were given up or forfeited by individuals linked to Jolo. Now, Tantri Muyerin said with the most recent tranche of $300 million, a total of $620 million of 1MDB monies in the form of sales proceeds or assets have been returned to Malaysia. Now, the Prime Minister said the process to sell Jolo's remaining forfeited assets under the DOJ consent for feature judgment is ongoing. Well, he added that efforts to recover 1MDB's assets are ongoing and the government will continue to work with the U.S., the DOJ and other governments to recover and repatriate more 1MDB monies in the future. Well, it is imperative for ASEAN to work closely with its plus three partners to ensure that Asia-Pacific recovers from the economic impact of COVID-19 together. Now, in a special ASEAN plus three summit on COVID-19 conducted via a video conference, Prime Minister Tantri Muhyiddin Yassin said Malaysia has proposed that ASEAN formulate an economic recovery plan post-COVID-19 that focuses not only on the financial aspects, but also on social safety nets, food security and education. The Prime Minister said a coordinated and integrated recovery plan would be fundamental to ASEAN's future and resilience post-COVID-19, adding that this is crucial to maintain market stability and prevent the potential risk of an economic recession. He said Malaysia views this as the perfect avenue for the plus three partners to assist ASEAN as a regional bloc to ensure the economies are revived and the welfare of the collective 600 million citizens are preserved. For now, Malaysia is of the view that we must remain committed to keep our markets open, maintain normal flows of trade, services and investment to strengthen our regional economic resilience without unnecessary barriers to trade or disruption to global supply chains. Furthermore, we must stabilize the manufacturing and supply of essential goods and services required for this crisis including vital medical supplies and critical agricultural products, all while sustaining and diversifying supply chain connectivity within the region and beyond. For Malaysia, Tansri Muhyiddin said the country is aware of the adverse impact of COVID-19 on its economy and most importantly on the lives of its people. Recently, Malaysia announced three stimulus packages including additional measures to boost struggling micro, small, medium enterprises or MSMEs worth 260 billion ringgit, which is 18.1% of the country's gross domestic product GDP. Well, meanwhile, Malaysia will share its findings with experts and scientists from ASEAN and the three plus partners, China, Japan and South Korea, to jointly pursue efforts in search of a vaccine for COVID-19. Now, Tansri Muhyiddin said Malaysia was amongst the first countries to work with the World Health Organization, or WHO, for the Solidarity Trial Research Project in finding a potential cure for the pandemic. Malaysia is amongst the first countries to work with the World Health Organization, WHO, for the Solidarity Trial Research Project in finding a potential cure for COVID-19. And this involvement in a globally coordinated trial allows us to collect data, compare safety and effectiveness of treatment protocols using different drug combinations. 
The Premier also shared Malaysia's experiences and knowledge in facing the COVID-19 pandemic. Tan Sri Muhyiddin said Malaysia has been aggressively increasing its capacities to conduct more tests per million per capita, rigorous contact tracing and treatment to all patients regardless of their level of symptoms and illnesses. The Ministry of Health, MOH, has detected a new cluster of COVID-19 cases in Sundayan, Nagri Sambilan, involving a Tafiz centre. The Health Director General, Dr. Dr. Nor Hisham Abdullah, said to date, 39 positive cases have been detected from the cluster. Yang uh, di Sundayan contohnya, kita ada uh, 39 kes yang positif dan uh, yang melibatkan 13 pelajar Tafiz dan satu keluarga 11 orang dan juga lembaga pengarah 15 orang. Jadi kita dapati ada penularan penyakit ataupun uh, virus COVID di Sedayan dan tindakan uh, bersepadu telah dilaksanakan dan sedang dilaksanakan uh, oleh pegawai-pegawai kita di lapangan dan kita harap kita dapat membendung penularan, penularan uh, virus COVID uh, di, uh, di uh, Sendayan. Commenting further, Dato Dr. Noor Hisham said 28 virus clusters were detected in the country with the largest cluster being in Sri Pataling so far. The Health Ministry is closely monitoring the stock level and usage of each type of personal protective equipment, PPE in every state. Now, Health Director General Dr. Dr. Noor Hisham Abdullah said the monitoring is done through a reporting and online database system that is easily managed by officers at state health departments, hospitals and district health officers, including health clinics under their purview. Explaining that the issue of PPE shortages was a global one currently, Dr. Dr. Noor Hisham said the use of PPE in health ministry's facilities has surged as a result of the pandemic. Terdapat beberapa jenis PPE yang digunakan oleh petugas kesihatan. Misalnya, footwear ataupun boot cover baki stok di Kementerian Kesihatan adalah 78 hari. Protective head cover baki stok ialah 52 hari. Alat penutup hidung dan mulut jenis 3-ply mask baki stok 47 hari. Alat penutup hidung dan mulut jenis surgical N95 N95 mask baki stok 37 hari. Disposable face shield baki stok 25 hari. Disposable fluid resistant apron baki stok 23 hari. Jumpsuit ataupun protective overall baki stok 19 hari dan gaun plastik biasa dan lain-lain jenis PPE. To ensure PPE stock continues to be sufficient, Dr. Dr. Noor Hisham said the ministry was in the midst of procuring them in bulk at both federal and state levels, adding that the ministry also welcomed PPE contributions from the private sector, non-governmental organization and donors. He added that the ministry is also closely working with the National Security Council, the National Disaster Management Agency, NADMA, and other federal agencies to ensure this stock issue is given specific focus. While deleting fake news posts about COVID-19 on social media and then apologizing will not get you off the hook. Now that is Senior Minister Dato Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob's stern warning to the public because there are still irresponsible individuals who are spreading fake news while frontliners are doing their best to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. Saya ingin memberikan ingatan. Ya. Saya tak nak sebut amaran Tetapi saya ingin memberikan ingatan 
selepas posting dikeluarkan walaupun memadamkannya pihak polis masih boleh terus melakukan siasatan dan mengambil tindakan undang-undang untuk menghadapkan mereka ke mahkamah dan sebagainya. Kita dengar baru-baru ini ada seorang individu yang mengeluarkan berita palsu terlepas itu memadamkan meminta maaf dan memadamkan tetapi sudah dipahamkan pihak polis juga memanggil individu tersebut untuk disoal siasat. The minister said police would continue to take action irregardless of whether fake news is uploaded onto social media, media portals and such. Dr. Suriz Malsabri said the police and the Malaysian Communication and Multimedia Commission, MCMC, had opened as many as 217 investigation papers in connection with the dissemination of fake news on COVID-19. This included 162 investigations which were still underway, while 23 individuals had been charged in court with full pleading guilty. Well, police arrested 11 people, including a 15-year-old, for allegedly having a wild party at a homestay in Masai, Johor, during the movement control order, the MCO period yesterday. Now, Johor Police Chief Dr. Ayub Khan Maidin Bijay said the suspects, comprising eight males and three females aged between 15 and 23, were arrested by a team from the Johor Narcotics Criminal Investigation Department at 12.45 a.m. Now, police also seized 2.08 grams of ketamine and four ecstasy pills in the raid. Dr. Ayub Khan said three of the suspects, including a woman, had criminal records for drug-related offences. He added preliminary investigations showed that all the suspects were not occupants of the premises but also failed to give a reasonable excuse for gathering there. Now, the urine tests of seven of the men and the three women were positive for ketamine and metafetamine. Now, they have been remanded for three days for investigation under sections 12, subsection 2, and 15, subsection 1, subsection A, of the Dangerous Drugs Act 1952 and Regulation 11 of the Prevention and Control of Infectious Diseases Act 2020. Young Dibtuan Agong al-Sultan Abdullah Riaya Tudin al Musawa Billah Shah today held a pre-cabinet session with Prime Minister Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin via video conference at Istana Negara. Well, according to Istana Negara's comptroller of the Royal Household, Dr. Ahmad Fadil Samsudin, it was the first ever video session held for the pre-cabinet meeting following the ongoing movement control order, the MCO. Now, in a statement today, Dr. Ahmad Fadil said al-Sultan Abdullah had wanted the pre-cabinet meeting be continued through a video conference during the MCO to discuss current issues. Well, he said today's session, which started at 8.30 a.m., lasted 45 minutes. During the session, the Prime Minister had expressed gratitude to the King for His Majesty's offer to waive the royal emoluments for six months due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, meanwhile, Dr. Ayub Khan also confirmed the arrests of a Singaporean couple and seized drugs worth about 41,000 ringgit in a raid on a condominium in Johor Bahru. The Johor police chief said the 25-year-old man and his girlfriend, aged 23, were arrested at 8.20 p.m. by a narcotics criminal investigation team from the Johor Contingent Police headquarters. Now, in a statement, Dr. Ayub Khan said further investigation revealed that the two suspects were in possession of drugs believed to be ecstasy pills and shabu. Now, during the raid, police also seized a car, jewelries and cash, including Singapore dollars. He said the total seizure was worth almost 200,000 ringgit, adding that both suspects tested positive for metafetamine. Now, Dr. Ayub Khan said the couple has been remanded for six days starting today, and the case is being investigated under Section 39B the Dangerous Drugs Act 1952, which carries the mandatory death sentence if convicted. Dutch hospital bids set up in Hall, planned for Eurovision contests. Details right after this.
of our news. Now, faced with a once-in-a-century economic crisis, governments are rolling out massive spending programs that will increase debt and deficits. But IMF economist Jean-Maria Melesi Ferretti said now is not the time to worry about that. Now, the deputy chief of the International Monetary Fund's research department said the best medicine is to prepare the restart growth once the COVID-19 pandemic has passed. There is extreme uncertainty. We know in general that economic forecasting is very hard, that uh, we are wrong all the time. Uh, uh, we may be wrong for the right reasons, but we are wrong all the time. Some shock happens, something changes the way we, uh, the economy actually performs. But in this case, the uncertainty comes from so many sources, uh, in particular from the nature and of the disease. Governments are responding to this severe crisis with huge spending programs, but Melesi Ferretti said it is going to be extremely expensive, although it is extremely important and extremely necessary. Well, the 2020 Eurovision Song Contest scheduled for May in Rotterdam has been cancelled for the first time in the event's 64-year history due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Now, broadcasters were now in talks with the Dutch port city for it to host the event, a glitzy pageant of songs that has millions of viewers across Europe and further afield in 2021. Meanwhile, dozens of hospital beds have been set up in the Concert Hall Ahoy Arena in Rotterdam, where the song contest was supposed to take place in May to receive patients infected by COVID-19 or other diseases who need care but are not required to go to the hospital. Ja, als veiligheidsregio waren we volop in de voorbereiding voor het voor het Eurovisie Songfestival. Dat stond en dan komt er opeens een crisis en dan is het heel snel schakelen en dan eh, zijn we ook als veiligheidsregio zijn we daar voor ingericht hè? en wij zijn een crisisorganisatie. Je weet nooit wanneer een crisis komt, maar als die er is, dan zijn we gelijk gaan handelen en eh, toen. Eurovision is the latest in a series of high-profile cultural and sporting events to be cancelled because of coronavirus, including the Euro 2020 football championships and Britain's Glastonbury Music Festival. Europe has become the epicenter of COVID-19 with more than 3,400 deaths now recorded, according to an AFP tally surpassing the number in Asia. The Netherlands has itself recorded 58 deaths and 2,051 cases in total. In Syria, the Damascus government has closed borders, forbidden movement between provinces and shot schools and restaurants in an effort to stem the spread of the virus. Official numbers are low with two deaths and 19 confirmed cases, but only 100 patients are being tested daily, with half of the testing carried out in the capital, Damascus. Now, experts accuse Damascus of minimizing its death toll for political motives. Zaki Metchi, senior consulting fellow at London-based think tank Chatham House, said medical staff believe that there are many people who are dying in Syria with the symptoms of the virus. Now, aid groups are sounding the alarm on the potentially devastating consequences of a severe outbreak in Syria where nine years of war have hit hospitals and left them all equipped to deal with the pandemic. According to the World Health Organization, the WHO, less than two-thirds of hospitals were up and running at the end of 2019 and 70% of healthcare workers have fled since the war began in 2011. The International Committee of the Red Cross ICRC warned that physical distancing is possible in displacement camps in Idlib, the last rebel-held province which was already enduring a humanitarian crisis before the pandemic started. The IRC said that almost all of the 105 intensive care beds and 30 adult ventilators in Idlib were already in use. For Syria, expert Fabrice Balash, associate professor and research director at the University of Lyon Don, said the epidemic is a way for Damascus to show that the Syrian state is efficient and all territory should be returned under its governance. Women and children fell to the ground, bloodied and trampled in a desperate search for food being handed out in a Nairobi slum as police fired tear gas and men with sticks beat the hungry. As African countries grapple with the coronavirus pandemic, observers warn that the traumatic scenes which played out last Friday will not be the last if governments fail to help millions of urban poor who live hand to mouth. 
Well, the virus arrived late in Africa, but it's slowly taking hold with over 15,000 cases and 800 deaths across the continent. While much of the developed world waited weeks to begin taking action, countries in Africa rapidly shut borders and banned mass gatherings. Mauritius, Rwanda and Tunisia were the first to impose full lockdowns, with Mauritius going so far as to shut supermarkets and bakeries for 10 days. South Africa is the biggest economy in the continent to completely confine its citizens, while Nigeria imposed lockdowns lockdowns on Lagos and its capital Abuja, which on Monday were extended for another two weeks. In sub-Saharan Africa, Liberia and Zimbabwe have also imposed full lockdowns. However, most nations across the continent have stopped short of forcing all their citizens to stay indoors. Madagascar and Ghana have completely locked down selected regions and towns, while Senegal, Mauritania, Guinea, Mali, Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso and Niger have imposed states of emergency and nighttime curfews. South Koreans headed to the polls today with a big turnout expected despite the COVID-19 threat making it the first country with a major virus outbreak to hold a national election since the global pandemic began. Well, a complex web of safety measures was spun around the ballot as well as the campaigning that preceded it. Now, the parliamentary poll vote kicked off at 6 a.m. with 43.9 million voters eligible to cast their ballots. And all citizens must wear protective masks and undergo temperature checks at the polling station. Now, those found to have a fever will cast their ballots in separate booths to be disinfected after each use. Voters have also been asked to wear plastic gloves after cleaning their hands with sanitizers at polling stations and to keep at least one meter apart. South Korea was among the first countries to be hit by the virus outside China, where the fire virus first emerged. Now, for a time, South Korea had the world's second largest outbreak before it was largely brought under control through a widespread testing and a contact tracing drive. Special polling stations were set up at eight central quarantine facilities at the weekend to enable residents to vote. But anyone who is staying at home and has developed symptoms is effectively disenfranchised. Now, campaigning has also been affected by the outbreak. Instead of the traditional handshakes and distributing of name cards, candidates have been keeping their distances from citizens and many have turned to online media such as YouTube and Instagram to connect with voters. U.S. President Donald Trump on Tuesday announced a suspension of U.S. funding to the World Health Organization because he said it had covered up the seriousness of the COVID-19 outbreak in China before it spread around the world. Now, Trump told a press conference he was instructing his administration to halt funding while, quote, a review is conducted to assess the World Health Organization's role in severely mismanaging and covering up the spread of the virus, unquote. Today, I'm instructing my administration to halt funding of the World Health Organization while a review is conducted to assess the World Health Organization's role in severely mismanaging and covering up the spread of the coronavirus. disperses cash payout to former national athletes in need of assistance during MCO. Well, the National Athletes Welfare Foundation, Yakib, and National Entrepreneurs Foundation, YUN, have donated 35,000 ringgit worth of medical supplies to frontliners in the fight against COVID-19. Now, among the items donated to the Salayang Hospital and Malaysian Red Crescent Society were body temperature scanners and personal protective equipment, such as gloves and masks. Yaqib Chairman Dr. Norul Arifin Abdul Majid said Salayang Hospital has helped provide medical care to many former national athletes in the past. The contribution was made possible with the support of the Malaysian Classic Motoring Association, Clover Rush, the National Hydrocephalus Foundation, as well as Fleury Flowers. Ini, uh, tak akan berhenti di sini. Kita akan uh, membantu, memberi sumbangan dan itu pun daripada uh, kerjasama dengan uh, pihak awam dan juga JLC dan juga Yayasan dan juga Persatuan membantu kami. Uh, kita nak sebutkan Yayasan Usahawan Negara, uh, Malaysian Classic Motoring Association dan juga dengan kerjasama Hospital Selayang.
On another note, Dr. Nurul Arifin disclosed that Yanke will continue to disperse cash payouts to former national athletes in need of assistance due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Another 50 former national athletes will receive 500 ringgit each this week from the 100,000 ringgit allocation provided by the sports ministry following the COVID-19 pandemic. He added for the first phase, they have credited 500 ringgit into the accounts of 75 Yanke members who are national athletes who had been identified as in need while a Another 50 will receive it this week. Dr. Nurul Arifin thanked the sports ministry for understanding the difficulties faced by former national athletes in these COVID hit days. Well, a month has now passed since the last football matches were played before packed stadiums in Europe. And the havoc wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic means that nobody can say with any certainty when the sport might return. Now, figures make the grim reading throughout Europe with Italy, Spain, France and the United Kingdom the worst hit. Countries across the continent are now weeks into restrictive lockdowns. Nobody knows when sport will be allowed to restart behind closed doors, let alone before crowds. The psychological impact of the current situation means many people may well now have second thoughts about mixing with vast crowds at a football match in future. Trasmissione ho sentito che qualcuno proponeva un monitoraggio più stretto magari con eh, test ripetuti ogni n giorni eh, ai calciatori sinceramente mi sembra un po' un po' tirata questa ipotesi credo che del resto stiamo quasi a maggio insomma su via credo che eh, dal punto di vista di un se dovessi dare un parere tecnico non, non darei in questo momento un parere favorevole sinceramente dopodiché sta la politica naturalmente a decidere Professor Giovanni Reza, head of the Department of Infectious Diseases at the Italian Public Health Institute, says that he would not give a favorable opinion to resuming the football championship amid the coronavirus pandemic. And with that, we conclude today's update at noon. Now, top story. The United States returns $300 million recovered from 1MDB asset seizures to Malaysia. Our dear friends, don't forget to wash your hands regularly, practice social distancing, and most of all, let's adhere to the movement control order and just stay at home. News on 2 comes on again at 7 this evening. I'm Amin Carlos. Thanks for watching.